I wanted to take just a couple minutes this morning. I felt like this morning would be an appropriate time to just do a really quick recap of what it is that we're doing here, uh, the series that we've been in, because there was a some kind of an interruption that happened this year. I don't remember what that was, but um, I just want to make sure everybody knows we're, we're still in the Unravel series. Um, and uh, so to, to kind of give you an overview of where we are, I put this on the slides for you just to help us step through this and see. So we, we started part one, and I just tried to divide the whole Bible up into sections that would make it uh, a little more uh, easy to grasp for us. So part one, really Genesis was the only book we looked at in part one, and we called that from paradise to slavery. Uh, the Bible opens with God creating the world and putting man and woman in the perfect environment. They had everything they could ever wish for, and yet they chose sin. And because of that, the downward spiral started. The book of Genesis opens with paradise and it ends with God's people in slavery in Egypt. We then went on to part two, where we started in Exodus, and God hears the cry of his people. He sends Moses and Aaron to Egypt to rescue his people from slavery, to bring them out of Egypt, and to give them his law, his commandments to live by, and to build the tabernacle and the holy place and the holy of holies and all of that that we've stepped through together over the last couple of years. And so they went really from, from slavery to this high standard of holiness that God called them to. And then in part three, we began looking at how, sadly, the, the, the cycle began again. They went from holiness to pride. God brought them through to the promised land. He led them. He fed them. He gave them this incredible place to live, and he warned them before they went in, be careful. When you get over there and you have nice houses to live in, you have nice fields to grow crops in, when your plates are full of food, be careful to remember the Lord your God. Guess what they did? They forgot. And they said, hey God, we got it from here. Thank you. We'll let you know if we need you. And they went from holiness to pride. And then we saw how God sent the judges, um, one judge after another, to, well, to judge the people, to, uh, to bring God's cry for repentance and to bring judgment upon them. The people got uh, cocky and asked for a king. God said, I'm your king. You don't need anybody else. And they said, no, no, we want to be like the other nations. And can I just tell you, students, especially for you, I think us... Older folks have maybe lived long enough to where that's not such a huge temptation for us. I think we've got the scars to remind us of how deadly that is. But students, I would say to you, be very, very careful about wanting to be like the other nations. Be very careful. God has called us to be a people who are holy and set apart. And I'm telling you, I was having a conversation with, with someone just recently, that I really believe that the, the young people today uh, have the hardest job of growing up of maybe any generation that I know of. The peer pressure, the whole social media thing, you know, I only got four likes on this, so people don't like me. I mean, it is brutal. And the, the pull that will be on you, students, to, to want to be like the world is going to be very strong. I encourage you uh, to, to stand where your parents are, are training you and leading you um, and just trust God for the long run more than trying to satisfy the immediate. Trust God that he will honor you down the road if you honor him today. And it's tough. I know it is. If we can help you with any of that um, at any time, uh, you let us know. So now we're, we're through step uh, part three there. We are in the, about the middle of the book of 2 Kings. And as I mentioned back when we started the book of Jonah, 
that we're now moving into sort of the last phase of the Old Testament, which is the prophets. And so um, we're now in part four, which for the rest of the Old Testament will be uh, the prophets. They're divided. I, I honestly have never liked the, the title that has been given to the two groups of prophets. They're called the major prophets and the minor prophets. I, I think that was one of the worst decisions they ever made because it's so confusing. Major prophets are called that simply because their writings are much longer. The minor prophets are called minor prophets because their books are much shorter. It's just a terrible choice of words. It's confusing. Uh, it makes us think that the minor prophets are, well, you know, less important. And that's not the case at all. So we're going to be, since the, since the, the time of the prophets overlays, begins to overlay the time in 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles, we're going to begin sort of jumping out and looking at the prophets in chronolog chronological order, the best that we understand it, and then jumping back into 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to navigate our way through that. So we just finished looking at Jonah, and today I want to ask you to turn in your Bibles, please, to the little book of Joel. Joel. And I'll give you about a week to find that. It's tucked away in there. It's not turned too often, but it is a, it is a beautiful little book, the book of Joel. As I was thinking about this message, I was reminded of how there are some people, I'm not one of them, there are some people who are incredibly gifted at restoring broken things. Broken cars, broken clocks, broken houses. We have a man in our church who is currently restoring an old, old house. I think he said it was a Civil War era house down in Georgia. He's restoring that to bring life to it again. Um, we have a man in our church who restores vintage motorcycles. He takes rusty, broken down motorcycles and turns them into this work of art uh, that now has worth again. Uh, I've seen some really beautiful pieces of furniture that people have made from old, weathered, discarded pieces of wood. And they've taken that and they've worked on it and they have created something beautiful and something useful. They've restored it to life again. And in this little book of Joel, we see God as the great restorer of broken things, the restorer of lost things. The first half of this book, it's a very short book, just three small chapters, the first half of this book is pretty dark. Joel talks about a devastating plague of locusts that um, comes in and sweeps across the entire land, destroys everything in its path, leaving nothing but dust and dryness and death. It was so severe that the vegetation and crops in the land were completely wiped out and Joel said that nothing like this had ever been seen before, so it must have been something. But thankfully, the second half of Joel is filled with hope. Joel tells the elders and the people to repent and call on the Lord because this plague had come in as God's judgment upon sin. And so Joel tells them to repent, to weep, to lament, to call on the Lord, and then he concludes this book with one of the most beautiful messages of hope and restoration that I know of anywhere in the Bible. And he's saying that God has not only promised to, you know, just barely restore everything that has been lost, but he's going to go far above that, and he's going to restore it in abundance because he is a good God. 
We'll only have time to look at the first half of this little book today. And boy, I get nervous when I say this now. Next week, we'll finish up (laughs) the second half. It'll be next week or next year. I'm not sure. Let's just wait and see how the week goes. I honestly, um, I I have a whole new take on saying that now. Um, But God willing, we'll finish up the second half next week. It's interesting that when some people think of this book of Joel, all they think of is um, the, the plague of locusts that came through. All they think of is the devastation, the desolation, um, the, the troubles and problems that came as a result of that. But when I think about the book of Joel, I always think about the word restoration. Restoration. Because Joel reminds us that when it's all said and done, when this circus down here is over, when time is finished, God will restore everything that sin has ruined in this world that he created. And he will forever restore and renew what sin has destroyed inside of us. All his enemies will be vanquished. All his critics will be silenced forever. And his justice will right every wrong that has ever been done. Which is a beautiful footnote on what we talked about last week. About us not taking vengeance. About us not labeling things as us and them. Us Christians and those lost sinners, but knowing that God's grace was intended for all of us, for the abused and the abuser. I hope you've had time to maybe think on that this past week. That was a tough one to take in. But God will right every wrong. And so in this life, as we go through this life, we're going to face lots of injustices. There's no point being surprised by them. There's no point getting angry about them. We are going to be mistreated. We're going to face injustices. People are going to um, cut corners with us and take advantage of us. And understand that's going to happen. It happens to everybody in the world. But it seems that we are sometimes um, targets for those kinds of things. You need to just tuck away somewhere. Uh, we'll, see, we'll see this uh, at the end of Joel. We'll see this at the end of the little book of Obadiah and, and so many others that when it's all said and done, trust me, uh, God will get the last word and he will reign in Zion. He will be upon his holy hill and no one will ever threaten him again. No one will ever, ever do what Psalm 2 tells us the people did. They, uh, they said, we're going to shake off God's chains. We're going to go and do our own thing. We don't, we don't need him or his son. And God who sits in the heavens laughs because he knows it's just a matter of time. It's just a matter of time. Well, the, the author Joel in this book Frankly, we don't know much about him at all. Um, We know his father's name, and we don't know anything about his father, except perhaps we could maybe conclude that uh, his parents were God-fearing people simply because of the name that they gave him, Joel. They would pronounce it Yoel, Y-O-E-L. When you break that name down, the first two letters of his name mean Yahweh, The last two letters of his name, E-L, mean God, as in Elohim, El Elyon, El Shaddai, and so on. So Joel, or Yoel, means Yahweh is God. That's quite a name. It's interesting how words break down. I'm sharing some of this with uh, my daughter this week. She finds this kind of stuff fascinating, as I do. Um, just the, the etymology of words and the meaning that 
they carry. Um, I was thinking about something I recognized when I was a kid. We were traveling, and I pointed to out the uh, terminal window to the airline that we were about to get on. It was Israeli Airlines, and they have painted on the sides of the plane the letters E-L-A-L. And then they also have it in Hebrew. And I asked my dad, what does that mean? And he explained to me, as a little boy, L is the name for God, and A-L means air, or up, or it can mean to the skies. So Israeli's airlines is literally named God of the skies. Isn't that cool? Um, I, I did some quick research this week and noticed, I guess not to my surprise, that almost all the modern secular sources that refer to Israeli airlines have now stripped the name God out of the definition. And they say it simply means to the skies. I wanted to write to Wikipedia and all the others I checked and say, liars? That's not what it means. Well, the structure of this book is a little odd. The way Joel writes this book is he mentions one topic in one verse, and then in the next verse, he goes right on to talk about the next topic, and the next topic, and the next. And then six or eight or ten verses later, he'll come back to that first topic, and he'll add some more thoughts to it, and then the next one, and so on. So it's like building up layers, and in order to, um, you know, for us to connect these different themes together and move through this with some continuity, we're going to have to move forward and backward through these verses, but I think it'll make perfect sense once we get going. So let's get going. Um, Joel chapter 1, verse 1. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, son of Pethuel. Hear this, you elders, and give ear, all you inhabitants of the land. Has anything like this happened in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Tell your children about it. Let your children tell their children and their children another generation. Now, I'm going to explain verse 4. There's some differences in translations here. What the chewing locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the crawling locust has eaten. And what the crawling locust left, the consuming locust has eaten. I think this is where Dr. Seuss got his idea for <laughs> some of his books. Can't believe I made it through that without tripping. So verse 4 in the King James, if you have the King James, I wanted to put that side by side with this, because the King James seems to be talking about four completely different types of insects, and it's thrown some people off. It's actually not confusing at all. Um, what's going on here is that the Hebrew words used here are actually referring to four different stages of development of the locusts. And so the King James choosing to translate it in, in the way that they did, talking about um, the... Uh, yeah, there it is, the palmer worm, the canker worm. It sounds lovely, doesn't it? And so on. They, so they mentioned those names, those stages specifically. Um, you, we don't have time to dig into that, but you can pursue that on your own if you uh, have the desire. I just wanted to mention why that may look different in your version. <clears throat> now, one of the, you may remember, one of the ten plagues that God sent to Egypt was a plague of locusts. It was, um, it was the eighth plague. After that was darkness and then the death of the firstborn. So God sent a plague of locusts back then, and we see this happening again now. And I'll, I'll tell you, I try to appreciate all God's creatures. Uh, locusts ain't one of them. <laughs> These are bizarre slightly spooky creatures. Um, there are some countries in the world 
where locusts can grow larger than a man's hand. Imagine those hopping on you. Um, there are many, there are hundreds of different types of locusts. Many of them have a face that looks just like a horse. Did you know that? It's really bizarre. This is why the Bible refers to them sometimes as horses marching, horses coming. Um, they have massive teeth that can chew through just about anything. They have enormous back legs that are spring-loaded. They crawl, they hop, they fly, and they will wipe out an entire crop in just minutes. Here's one article from the National Geographic from years ago. They said, at the end of February, great clouds of locusts began flying into the land from a northeasterly direction. They came in enormous numbers, settling on the fields and hillsides where they laid their eggs in vast numbers. We're told that people have seen locust swarms coming in so thick by the millions that it virtually blocks the sun out in the middle of the day. It is calculated that some 60,000 locusts could come from the eggs planted in a 30 square inch area of soil. Once hatched, the new brood starts crawling across the ground, devouring every scrap of vegetation in their path. I brought a couple of photos just to creep you out a little bit and <laughs> let you see. Put that first photo up there and let them see. There's a, there's a snapshot of <clears throat> some locusts coming in from Egypt to Israel. And then go to the next one. You can see another lovely day there in Locustville. I didn't bring any close-up pictures because, you know, I knew people would run out of the building screaming. So um, the locust swarms are really an interesting, curious thing to, to study, uh, the way they move. Um, swarms of locusts have been sort of recorded moving across the ground at a pace of two to 300 yards a day and stripping every piece of green vegetation off the land, including stripping the bark off the trees and the branches. Devours everything, even down to the roots. They'll eat the roots of some plants. People have said when these locust swarms come in that you can literally hear the chewing, the crunching of millions of locusts all eating the plants at once. Uh, in Australia, we had... Uh, I don't know if you'd call it plagues, but uh, plagues of frogs. And driving home at night on the little country road, you'd see in the headlights thousands of frogs jumping, and you'd run over them. And, um, so nature is, uh, is really interesting. I'm glad we live in Greenville. Not too bad here. But in parts of the world where this is a problem, swarms of locusts will will blanket the ground for as far as the eye can see. And they march forward in ranks, almost like a military. In fact, um, Joel will use the locust plague as a picture of the huge armies that will one day come against the land. He talks about the desolation that will come in the last days, how there will be armies so large coming to war that they'll cover the earth like locusts. Uh, one example of that is in verse 6. He said, for a nation has come up against my land, strong and without number. His teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he has the fangs of a fierce lion. Now, Joel likens this plague of locusts to the judgments of God. Chapter 1, he describes the desolation that is going to come or came upon the, the physical land. And then he uses that to make direct spiritual application. Now, we, we mustn't miss this. I've taken a while to kind of introduce this this morning so we can set the scene properly. But the last thing I want to happen is for everybody to leave here today thinking that we, all we did was talk about locusts. And isn't that bizarre? And how sad that that plague happened and all of that in history. The Bible always uses these things just as Jesus used parables, not just to pass the time, 
but to point us to higher truth and make application, spiritual application to our lives. And that's what Joel is doing in this book, not only for those people back then, but for us as well. This whole thing we must understand, this whole thing that we're going to see and, and that's described here is a picture of how sin always brings destruction in the end. It might take years. It might take generations. But sin always leads to trouble and sorrow. This plague that came upon God's people, it wasn't a random event. It was judgment for their waywardness. Look at a few examples of how Joel describes the destruction caused by these locusts. Verse 10, the field is wasted, the land mourns, for the grain is ruined, the new wine is dried up, the oil fails. Now that's not a big deal to us, but that was their economy then. This was huge devastation and loss. Verse 12, the vine has dried up and the fig tree has withered, the pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree. All the trees of the field are withered. Surely joy has withered away from the sons of men. Verses 17 and 18. The seed shrivels under the clods. Storehouses are in shambles. Barns are broken down, for the grain has withered. How the animals groan. The herds of cattle are restless because they have no pasture. Even the flocks of sheep suffer punishment. I want you to see just how everything imaginable is now suffering because of sin. Everything is suffering. Their sin started out so small. This is no big deal. This isn't going to hurt anybody. And yet, it has now spread like wildfire, and it's affecting everything that it touches. The animals in the land suffer. The crops are destroyed. The trees have withered. The animals and cattle are suffering. The barns have been neglected, and they're falling down. The people suffer. Their joy has withered. The worship of God has suffered. The priests are suffering. Look at verse 9. The grain offering and the drink offering have been cut off from the house of the Lord. Why? Because there's nothing to bring. The priests mourn who minister to the Lord. Even the Lord himself is saddened by what is taking place. Look at verse 7. I told you we had to jump around. <clears throat> he has laid waste my vine, God says, and ruined my fig tree. He has stripped it bare and thrown it away. Its branches are made white. In other words, all the bark has been stripped off, and you just see that white uh, branch underneath. <clears throat> all this disaster, all this suffering has come on the people for one reason. It is a direct result of their unfaithfulness to God. See, here's the thing. So many people will hear something like this from the Bible. They, they get drive-by verses. You know what I mean? They hear this, and immediately their heart turns against God. What kind of a sick God would do that to his people? Oprah Winfrey said that she eventually, she grew up in church. She said herself that sitting in church one day, she heard the verse, God is a jealous God. And she said, well, any God who's jealous is not a God I want to serve. And she turned her back and she walked away. Those are her words. Well, the problem is, it's a complete misunderstanding of the verse. What a shame to turn your life in a completely different direction because you didn't take the time to understand what you heard. And so we see this, and if we just take this little snippet of Joel chapter 1, Knowing that this is not a random event, this is from God, we could walk away thinking, yeah, they're kind of right. God's mean. 
But what we see, we've already seen throughout the entire Old Testament, is that God has always given his people, he's always given us as well, a choice. We saw this in Deuteronomy. Called the people together. And they were getting ready to go over into the promised land. And God said, I set before you today a choice. Life and death. And then I love how God gives them the answer. He fills in the answer on their test. He says, now choose life. Why would he have to tell them that? Because we would choose death. We would choose sin. We would choose destruction every time. Our flesh hates God. Our flesh hates to submit to him. This is why Paul said, I beat myself into submission. That old flesh of mine, you've got to get up every day, and you've got to put that to death again every day. It'll fight you to the end. Your soul is saved. Your flesh isn't. And so... God has always said to his people, I want so much to bless you. I want to care for you. I want to protect, for you, protect you and provide for you. But you must obey me. If you don't, there's another promise waiting in the wings that I do not want to unleash. But if you choose to disobey me, judgment must come. If God doesn't live up to that second part, then he cannot be a holy God. Any God who just dismisses sin and says, meh, whatever, it's not a holy God. Sin has to be punished. And so these two promises have always been there. And as I said a moment ago, sin always leads to trouble and sorrow, but not just for us. Our sin doesn't just hurt us. It hurts other people. Maybe not today, but eventually it will. The suffering that came from this plague was so widespread. Everyone and everything around was ultimately um, hurt because of it. The land suffered. The crops suffered. The animals suffered. The buildings suffered. The people suffered, the priests suffered, the worship suffered, the offerings suffered. On and on you could go. God himself suffered. He was grieved by this. And we dare not miss this obvious lesson that no one sins alone. You may be alone when you sin, but you're not sinning alone. And neither am I. The Bible talks about how The sins of the fathers have been visited upon their children to the third and fourth generation. Now, let me be clear. Your children and grandchildren are not going to be judged for your sin. The Bible makes it very clear uh, that every one of us will give an account of himself to God. Romans talks about that. Your children and grandchildren won't be judged for your sin, but they sure might suffer the consequences of your sin. Boy, I've seen this play out so many times as a pastor, so many times. People, adults, still carrying the pain and the natural consequences of something that happened 40 years ago with their parents. Well, I need to move on. In addition to describing this devastating plague that destroyed the whole land as a result of the people's sin, Joel also talks about something very specific that we shouldn't miss. I'll just touch on this. Five times in this little book, he refers to something called the day of the Lord. Here are some examples. Verse 15 of chapter 1. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as destruction from the Almighty. Chapter 2, verse 1. Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is at hand. Chapter 2, verse 11. 
For the Lord gives voice before his army, for his camp is very great. Strong is the one who executes his word, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? Now, just quickly here, Joel is speaking prophetically about a future time when the land is going to be laid waste by the judgment of God. The Bible speaks again and again, Old and New Testament, about a time when God is going to judge the earth. He's going to send plagues upon the earth. It's going to be a time of panic and sheer terror. Uh, A famine will sweep across the entire globe. There's going to be tremendous suffering. That part is mentioned in um, Revelation. Now, there's a lot that, that could be said about the day of the Lord. I'll have to leave that for another day, Um, but there are many other books that we're going to get into that will talk about the day of the Lord. In fact, the the prophets that will come after Joel will pick up this phrase, and they will use it again and again and again and again, to the point where it becomes so familiar to the people that often the writers will simply call it the day, and they'll be like, whoa, say no more. We know what you're talking about. Now, in the New Testament, again, I I, I don't have time to pursue all this, but uh, there's a, a, a time that is referred to as the day of Christ or the day of Christ Jesus. Um, again, we'll get into that eventually, but I just wanted you to know as you see that phrase there that it is, it's something, uh, it's more than just a passing comment. Joel is speaking prophetically about a very specific time that will come. But for now, Joel wants to make sure the people know what to do about this mess that they're in. In the book of Joel, we see the same three steps that we've seen throughout the entire Old Testament already. Judgment, repentance, and restoration. The people sin, God sends judgment. They repent, and he restores them. They sin, and he sends judgment. That's the summation of almost the whole Old Testament. May that not be a summation of your life and mine. We have this book to learn from, to be warned by. Thankfully, though, after describing this darkness, this terrifying judgment, Joel doesn't just leave the people there. He begins talking about what their response needs to be. And I want to start winding it down with this. Look at verse 12 of chapter 2. Now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Underline that word, therefore. That is a beautiful, life-giving word in this context. The word, therefore, in that verse is really the center point of this whole book. It's almost like a hinge in the middle of this book that's going to turn things one way or the other. What that word means here in this context is that God is giving his people a chance to turn around. He's he's describing all of this terrible judgment, this plague. And he says, now, therefore, it means in view of this, let me tell you what to do about it. How often does God do this to us? As I said, he, he tells us what the outcome will be of our choices ahead of time. He says, man, if you follow me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be uh, your God. You'll be my people. We'll dwell together. It's going to be amazing. But if you turn against me, I'm just telling you, it's going to be horrible. Judgment is going to fall on you. Don't take that route. Now, therefore, in view of what I've told you, here's the better plan. He says, turn to me with all your heart. Listen, don't miss this. 
the judgments of God are never meant to be an end in themselves. The judgments of God are always meant to lead us back to him. And that should be the same in correcting employees. It should be the same in disciplining children. That judgments, that discipline are never an end in themselves. They're always meant to call us back to the right path. It grieves the heart of God so deeply when he sees the people he created to bring him glory, turning their backs on him and walking away. And so every judgment of God brings with it a call to lament and a call to repent. And we see that here in the book of Joel. This word lament is something that's kind of foreign to us. God wants our heart to grieve like his heart grieves about our sin, but it rarely does. And so he, he pleads with us to be sorrowful over our sin, to repent of it and to return to him. But he also knows the temptation that people have of just going through the motions He doesn't just want us to do that. Look at verses 12 and 13. Now, therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and with mourning. Verse 13, so rend or tear, so rend your heart and not your garments. In that culture, when someone was grieving deeply, they would go out in public and they would tear their clothes. They still do it today in in some cultures there. It was a way of publicly letting other people know how deeply you were mourning and grieving. But God knows how easy it is to do something like that just as a public display, just to put on a show, to have the appearance of doing the right thing without the changed heart underneath This is exactly why Jesus said in Matthew 15, verses 8 and 9, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And so when God calls his people to lament and repent here in Joel, he's saying, I don't want your outward show. I want a broken heart. Tear your heart, not your clothes. But then maybe someone would ask, why though? Why why would I go through that? Why would I lament? Why would I repent? Is God just uh, adding more rules on? No, 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 no. That's never the reason. Our motivation for doing this is listed beautifully in one verse here, Joel 2, 13. He says, return to the Lord your God. Why? Watch this. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. See those five beautiful things? That's our God. Is that enough reasons for us to grieve over our sin and to return to him? God longs to spare us from the inevitable consequences of our sin because he knows that any person, any family, any church, any nation that turns away from him is headed for trouble. And I'll just tell you, uh, uh, America isn't just sinning on a personal level or a family level or a church level. We are sinning on a national level. The degree of open, blatant, willful sin and murder in our country is jaw-dropping. And it's easy for us as the church to sit in here and point fingers at 
the wicked world out there and say, well, if they would just clean up their act, our country would be a better place. But, but here's the thing. God calls upon his people to repent so that the nation can be restored. I'll give you one verse out of many. We know this so well. Hear it again for the first time. 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. So we'd better not sit around as Christians waiting for the world to clean up their act. Ain't going to happen. Not going to happen. God is waiting for his church, his bride, to get on their knees and call for revival and repentance in the land. Here's an absolute fact from history. You can check it out yourselves. We will not see a repenting nation until we see a repenting church. I'm so thankful for the faithful folks who gather here on Wednesday nights to call on the name of the Lord in prayer, not only for the people of this church, not only for our city, but for our nation as well. But sadly, I don't see praying churches in America. Uh, our, our friend John Stewart, when he and Philippa were in the States years ago, he and I went one Wednesday night to a church about 30 minutes from here a conservative, good church, uh, with over 4,000 members. We went, we drove out there on a Wednesday night to go to prayer meeting. There were about 20 people there out of more than 4,000. If my math serves me right, that's about 0.5%. I brought this quote for you to look at. Jim Cimbala said years ago, why are we fighting to put prayer back in our schools when we don't even have prayer in our churches? I think it's a fair question. It's not a stretch for me at all to to picture words like we've read in Joel being written about America one day. Our nation won't change until our churches change. Our churches won't change until our families change. And our families won't change until we as individuals change. So as we leave here today, I wonder if you would be willing to seek the Lord this week and ask him what he wants to begin changing in you. Not your husband, not your wife, not your kids, Not your parents, not your neighbor, not your boss, not your mother-in-law, in you. Would you be willing this week to begin with me, seeking the Lord in earnestness and saying, Lord, this nation is literally going to hell, and I have contributed to that in some way. Where would you like to begin with me, God, with me? In order to begin the change that God wants to see in our nation, it's going to have to happen in our church. And if it happens in our church, it's going to have to happen in our family. And if it happens in our families, it's going to have to happen to you. Let's pray. Father, um, thank you so much for this straightforward, clear description of righteous judgment that comes upon even a whole nation when they've turned away from you. And it's never because you're in a bad mood and you just wanted to hurt people. It's always because you want to call us back to you. So Lord, it's very easy for us to just kind of 
slough a message like this off and think, boy, I, I, hope, I hope America gets their act together. I hope the world gets their act together. And completely miss the point that we as individuals, we're all contributing to this. I pray, God, you would really speak to every one of us this week, every single one of us. And just bring to our mind just one thing, one place to start. One thing that you want to do in our life. And I pray we'd start there. And we just start there by faith and say, God, I, I don't want to do this so that I can look like a better person. I, I want to do this because I want to honor you. And I want to see change come to my family and to my church and to our nation and to the world. So start with us this week, Lord, I pray. And we'll be grateful for what you do in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.